our last session is a roundtable, and it's a roundtable discussion called Creating the Future Through Entrepreneurship Programs. And we are privileged to have here among this roundtable three extraordinary experts in the field, uh, most of whom you know. This is our trio of discussants. They, we have here next to me a musicologist and two performers, all of whom have extensive uh, work and research in entrepreneurship. Uh, Gary Beckman, who is seated next to me, is a professor at the University of South Carolina School of Music and is the research associate for the school's Carolina Institute for Leadership and Engagement in Music. And I'm going to get this right here pretty soon. You heard all about that uh, earlier from Taylor Harding. During his doctoral coursework in musicology at the University of Texas at Austin, Gary developed the nation's leading arts entrepreneurship curriculum and has recently completed the first nationwide study of arts entrepreneurship efforts in higher education. He has written articles on the topics of arts entrepreneurship, leadership in the arts, and intellectual entrepreneurship. And he'll be telling you a little bit more about this uh, in a moment. Michael Drapkin. Well, before, before you do yes. that, we also have to throw in about Gary's sorted past as a rock guitarist. <gasps> oh, so nice. he's, rock guitarist, he's heavy a, metal guitarist. Yeah, yeah. so he's uh, also a performer. <laughs> that, that couldn't go by without having been said, because he's also very, he's also learned a great deal about entrepreneurship from that. That That's implies. very important to be said. Thank you, Michael. I didn't know that about him. So, wow, I'm, I'm impressed. It wasn't in his bio. You need to put that in there. <laughs> yeah, it really should. What were you thinking? It was a you of conspiracy band. I mean, you know, who wants to let that get out? <laughs> Michael Drapkin, I think you know about Michael Drapkin, but just a little bit. Uh, he's got a great website, so if you want to know more about him, there's lots of information on his website. He is a clarinetist, a bass clarinetist, and has performed extensively throughout the country with major orchestras, with chamber music, and so on. He was, I'm going to use the past tense now, the founder and executive director of the Brevard Conference on Entrepreneurship and Music become at the Brevard Music Center, North Carolina. And we just learned today that uh, this is going to be going now to Puerto Rico. And it's uh, pre-com? PR-com. PR-com. And so it has now changed. So he'll be doing more or less the same thing, <coughs> but just in a different location. I think this is interesting about Michael. I don't know if you knew this. But in recognition of his groundbreaking work with Become, he was selected as a finalist for the 10 awards, an annual selection of 10 companies and individuals in the greater New York business community that display extraordinary leadership and innovation. I thought that was very impressive. In addition, Michael has worked to influence the creation and adopt and adoption of performance entrepreneurial program curricula and instruction at conservatories and colleges of fine arts to teach performers how to create demand for their abilities. So Michael, and our other Michael, Michael Miller, whom you have heard the also today. Oh, he's the other Michael. The other one, <laughs> uh, two Michaels and Gary. He holds the degree of Doctor of Musical Arts with concentrations in Performance and Arts Administration from Claremont Graduate University, where his teachers in management have included Peter F. Drucker. You heard him talk about Drucker. Um, and uh, the other teacher is Jen, uh, Jean Lipman Blumen. He is currently the Development Director of the Grammy Award-winning Southwest Chamber Music, uh, based in Southern California. He was earlier the executive director of the Santa Cl uh, Clarita Symphony, was a member of the Santa Clarita Arts Alliance, and served on the founding boards of the Santa Clarita Symphony. Michael is a Grammy award-winning bass trombonist and has been a freelance performer in Los Angeles for over 20 years. He's a member of the music industry uh, faculty at California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, California. So we have some real experts up here. We have another plant uh, out in the audience, and this is Taylor Harding mm -hmm. uh, at South Carolina, and Dean, and so on. And and Taylo is going to be asking some good questions here. So I've I've um, asked these gentlemen if they would first of all tell us a little bit about what they do. So Gary's going to begin to, uh, talking about his research uh, with entrepreneurial programs. Um, you may or may not know, 
um, when I was at the uh, University of Texas at Austin doing my, uh, after I'd finished my, um, my uh, coursework, quote unquote, and in an effort to, to stave off that little dissertation for just a year. Um, and, and also after, after teaching uh, my arts entrepreneurship course at UT for a couple of years, um, my deans were, uh, were very helpful in, in getting me a grant from the Kauffman Foundation to investigate representative arts entrepreneurship programs across the country, and I did that for a year. Um, the research, if you want to know, is published in the Journal of Arts Management, Law, and Society um, in the September 2007 issue, so you can read about it. Basically what it did was it interviewed students, faculty, department chairs, deans, and provosts on this topic. And what I tried to gather from them was their thoughts on it, both philosophically, morally, curricularly, and more importantly, um, their flat out honest opinions on whether or not entrepreneurship programs, entrepreneurship ethos, something like that should be somehow involved in music or arts training. And that's what I investigated. And, and I, if I'm right, it still remains the only, um, the only study in the nation on this topic. And, and because, of that, um, because of that wonderful little, little study, uh, I also have completed a website that I, that I keep reasonably, I don't know, what's the word, reasonably? Current? Current, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, reasonably current, www.ae2n.net. It's called the Arts Entrepreneurship Educators Network which lists um, an awful lot of things for um, those of us who teach this stuff. One of, the, one of the coolest things that I think is actually a map, geographical map of arts entrepreneurship programs across the country. I suggest that you take it, that, that you check that out and you can start seeing some interesting trends as far as what's going on. Can you spell that again? A-E-2-N dot net. Two, the number two. Number two. And <coughs> Lastly, um, um, as a result of that grant, um, I just got hooked, hooked on the uh, whole topic. So I've put musicology aside a bit, and my entire professional career is now, is now dedicated to this. So I write an awful lot on this topic, um, and, and that's sort of my, my contribution besides teaching. Um, and loving the, the uh, teaching end of it is really trying to get the, the scholarly base for this thing down pat um, as much as I can as much as I can. I'm certainly not, uh, I don't know it all, that's for sure, but at least there is, um, there's a body of literature out there that has some kind of legitimacy with regards to, I mean, specifically because of the journals that they're being published in, um, that hopefully you guys, if you want to start these programs, you can garner and take and use that language in support of your own programs. And that's kind of why, why I'm doing this, is I'm trying to give everybody as much ammunition as possible um, in a nice scholarly sort of way. So that's me. My turn? Yes, your turn. Great. You know, when we talk about elevator pitches, my biggest challenge with an elevator pitch is which particular one do I want to use? I, I've had an interesting career that has had two vectors. One is on in the business world, and the other one is in the professional music world. And I started out getting a degree in clarinet from the Eastman School of Music and wanting to pursue to get a symphony job. And lo and behold, a few years after I graduated, I landed a job and proceeded to intensely dislike it after all that work. But at least I, arraigned, I arrived at the top of the summit as opposed to wondering what it would be like. And one of the things I did starting at the end of high school was also working with computers and technology, which I did all the way through school as well. And in fact, all of my orchestra auditions were funded by doing programming in the New York City area, which was much better than waiting tables. So after I went out to Honolulu Symphony and decided I didn't like it, even though I was in paradise, I guess that was the acid test, um, I came back to New York and started doing a lot more technology and less music, but I never stopped being a clarinet player. I never thought of myself as not being a clarinetist. I never sold my instruments. And it led to some really interesting experiences working with probably 30 startup companies and the Fortune 500, including a stint for almost five years working at the now defunct Lehman Brothers on Wall Street, where I learned a lot of really amazing lessons about 
expectations and quality, which is not different than what we try to do as performers. So um, I had a really thriving consulting practice up until 9-11, and then being in New York City, the market totally died. And it really was, if I look back in that, to me that was a real watershed event, if I look back in my life, because it forced me to look back at my life and say, okay, I've done all these things, I've, I've learned ways that I can make a, a pretty good living in the business world, but what is really important to me? And I thought to myself, about what I had learned in business affected what I did in music, and what I did in music affected what I did in business. And it got me to thinking about how detached my curriculum at Eastman was from the real world. And I said, you know, I think with what I've been gifted in terms of the experiences I've had, I ought to be able to apply that towards coming up with something that's a little bit more useful or realistic. So I started doing some research and um, actually, what happened was uh, Jim Underkoffler, who was the currently the was the dean at Eastman, wrote. Um, they published his commencement address, and I sent him a very scathing response via email, which I still have up on the web somewhere, which basically said, "How in good conscience can you graduate all these people from your school without any thought about what they're going to be doing the day they graduate?" So, to make a long story short, he said, "Well, what would you do?" I said, "Well." Why don't you teach them something about being an entrepreneur? And he said, well, what kind of a curriculum would you suggest? So I came up with what I thought was a reasonable entrepreneurship curriculum. And uh, he actually had me select, uh, presented to select Eastman faculty. And I then put in a, uh, a paper presentation for CMS, which I presented at, at uh, the conference in San Francisco. And the rest is almost sort of history. I met all sorts of people there um, with the encouragement of Bob Freeman, who was my Eastman director. He introduced me to the Kauffman Foundation. I raised over $100,000 in grants from Kauffman, putting on conferences at the Brevard Music Center. I also met all sorts of wonderful people, many, many of which are in this room right now, and started thinking intensively about, well, how do we affect change in music higher education? What would that look like? Um, to me, the ultimate affirmation of the work that I believe I've done, and I'm not taking credit for it by any means, was listening to Taylor's wonderful keynote and thinking that, boy, how we come from, I said this before, we come from such different vectors in terms of our careers, yet we see everything so amazingly eye to eye. So um, it, it's really a pleasure to be able to take what I've learned and apply it to how we can really help push our passion for music, which is what it's really all about at the end of the day. And that's gonna be probably my theme for the next couple of years is, how do we express our passion for music in ways that haven't been done before so that we can make it a really relevant part of our society, so we can really be a driving force for what we do. And to me, the acid test was, and I'm almost done here, the acid test was, I, I started a new woodwind quintet and we played at this really funky woodwind, uh, funky uh, coffee house in Austin called Ruta Maya. And instead of doing a traditional concert, we just did individual movements. We got up and talked about why we thought they were cool. And uh, they told us afterwards they thought it was the best performance that they'd ever heard there before. And we forget the power of what we've taught our students to do. We forget about that, the fact that our, our students that graduate from our conservators, conservatories are so adept at what they can do. And the real crime is keeping that such a big secret from the audience, from the, from the public, from the potential people that are out there. So I get very passionate about this because I love music. And I want us all to feel passionate about how we can figure out ways of communicating that with the public and forget all the barriers, forget all the traditions. At the end of the day, are we moving people by what we do? And that's what really gets me going. And I don't care how we get there as long as we actually arrive. So that's my sermon for the day. Well, don't mince words, Michael. What do you really think? <laughs> I'm Michael Miller, and I'm on this panel uh, because of the uh, work that I did at the University of Colorado, which I'll tell you about in a minute. 
I've been a bit freelance bass trombone player in, in Los Angeles for many years, and I, I'm in a culture there where people are addicted to being the best musicians that have ever been on the planet. And the culture there, and that culture is, is amazing because it, it is full of excellence, it is full of people who want to be the best there is now and are still woodshedding to be great. The challenge for students that are coming into that culture is significant. And, and we feel like they are often just qualified to be music students. And that's not what we do. We're, we're professionals. And so I had thought about this for many years, and then I had a, a really transforming experience with my doctoral program at Claremont Graduate University, which is a very small program, and it's focused on, on the history of thought and ideas in the, in the music program. So, uh, so the aesthetics course, going back to Plato and Aristotle, gave me the f foundation for going and studying with Peter Drucker at the Drucker School, and that was eye-opening and, and remarkable. And coming out of that, I, with my professional experience, with the history of music ideas, and the thought of how management, administration, music, leadership, it all is about excellence in human endeavor. And my art is so important to me. I love music. I love doing what I do. I love being great at it, as great as I can be. And I love having the students of the next generation make it even better. So it's, so I'm very much into not only the playing side, but in, in management. I love my development job with Southwest Chamber Music because we are putting a footprint on the history of music out of our little small office, and it's fantastic. With students, I want to transmit some of that comprehensive thinking like I've talked about with, with communicating in public, with self-assessment and figuring out who you are and where you're going. And uh, so I took the opportunity to uh, go back to my alma mater, University of Colorado, for a year to fill in uh, for a year as uh, interim director of the Entrepreneurship Center for Music there. It had been started four years prior to my being there in 1998 by Catherine Fitterman, who was there uh, for four years. She's at New York University now. She did a great job establishing that. I went up there for a year. Kevin Wolfel uh, followed me for another four years, and uh, and now they're looking for a new director. There's a search going on right now, so any of you who want to uh, to apply, you can um, uh, you can give it a shot. The uh, but I had a great time up there, and what we did with our entrepreneurship center is we looked at at least my philosophy was not to tell students what to do with their career, not whether they want to be in music business or to be an educator or a composer or a performer or whatever. That wasn't my, I didn't see that as my uh, responsibility or goal, but just for them to decide what they were going to do and then to do that well and to be smart when they're doing it and to be, you know, understand, you know, the external world that they were getting into and be able to show up there just like when you practice in a practice room and you're playing orchestra excerpts to be prepared to go out and actually sit in the orchestra and, and make it's the same concept. And a lot of times what we're doing with, with students in, in many universities, they're, it's like they've been in the practice room for four years and they've never seen an orchestra before. They don't know what an orchestra is. They don't know how to fit into it. And so I, we had coursework there. We had, um, uh, we had advising. We had workshops. I, I uh, uh, hosted and or presented 27 uh, professional dev development workshops in my, in my year there. And uh, the advising was very important components so students one-on-one -on -one could come in and you could really help them shape, you know, what questions they had to answer. 
Uh, we have internships. We had an, uh, an entrepreneurship uh, competition where they had to submit a proposal, and if that was, if they got past the uh, lower part, which uh, pretty much everybody did who, who wrote a proposal, then they could present and, uh, and with a faculty panel and be able to actually get some funding to start up their project. And all of those things were, were very cool. I'm, I'm glad I did it. I may uh, do something like that uh, in the future, but I think it's important that all of us think about how we're preparing our students for the world out there because to me that is what the proper results are is you know the results of a good music education is going and making an impact in the world regardless of what the actual career is but to use that ed education to make a difference out there so that's that's my take on things Great, you've, uh, you've heard a bit from all three of these experts here, and I'm going to open it up to the floor. Uh, what are your questions that you would have for them? Are there, there are some special questions? Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Taylor and we'll go from here. I, I would like to ask Gary if he might, uh, you don't have to give a summary necessarily, but if, could you say a little bit about the findings of your research that really struck you? that stood out, there were things that you didn't expect to, to learn um, from uh, what you did learn? Since the study was, um, was really centered around best practices, I can, um, I really wasn't surprised about anything that really came out of that, necessarily. Um, I think... Uh, what did you find really well, meaningful then, if you weren't surprised? Were there things that that you, you, deter, you found out about that were really uh, powerful in their distinction from other things? Okay, then two things. Um, the number of faculty that, that, you know, in the privacy of their office mm -hmm. um, want this more than you know mm -hmm. and more than they would say publicly, and more than they would fight for. <laughs> also, um, along that same line, the amount of um, the amount of deans and department chairs who want this stuff badly and who and you know I was very lucky to to interview a few um, towards the end of their um, towards the end of their career who were staking an awful lot of political capital on on getting these programs up and running and and to watch that happen and to hear how that was um, you know you know basically put basically you know it I don't know what's, I don't know, probably just, they just basically, you know, doubled down on, you know, on the topic. And, and, and for them, the nice thing was, was that, was that for those deans and for those chairs, when they described um, entrepreneurship education in the arts or music or whatever, the reoccurring word, and I swear to you this happened, um, and this happened about a half a dozen times, was the word moral responsibility. And, and that was somewhat surprising, um, but when it was repeated time and time again with people who were putting their, putting political capital on the line for this, um, then you started to get a view when you started adding everything up. And the students, of course, you know, you know wanted this same kind of thing too. The other thing that, um, that I was very happy to, um, to see, especially over, over the course of, over the, course of, I don't know, probably the past two or three years, um, is that, is the way that, that people are approaching entrepreneurship education in the arts, is that they are very quickly moving away from, from just simply using um, the business model of entrepreneurship and actually understanding and realizing and leveraging um, new ideas and new theories and entrepreneurial theory um, to actually make their programs work operate and be effective. So I'm very happy about that and the business school is very happy about that too, that there are indeed you know, you know, new theories about entrepreneurship from there that music schools, art schools are bringing into, um, bringing into, the, bringing into arts units. In other words, to be really frank, everybody's starting to understand that this is contextual and that's, the, that's really the, the, the more surprising thing recently. I mean, it is contextual now, and everybody's realizing that. I think everybody's realizing that to the outcomes and metrics, whatever 
you know, however they are defined, um, I think that we're all realizing that it's got to be in the context of training. You know, we train theater students differently than the way that we train, train music students, than the way that we train music business students. The curriculum's going to have to be different. Sometimes you can see, you, sometimes you can see control of your entrepreneurship curriculum to the business school, and sometimes it's the worst thing in the world. So that's what they've been. But the single biggest, I'm going to jump in this. The single biggest takeaway I think I could give you all day if you want to create the future through entrepreneurship programs is to not reinvent the wheel. Yes, Gary is right in that we have our own, our own particular needs in the arts and within the arts, but don't reinvent the wheel in terms of things that are already out there. Um, I would probably venture to guess that the arts has been the last bastion of industries in the world or at least in business, to pick up the concept of entrepreneurship. There are other areas out there that have been doing it for decades. So very heavily leverage what they are doing. Yes, decide whether it's appropriate for you or not, but don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, most of the stuff that I put together are best practices that I've taken from the business world or from business schools. And take that, make it your own, make it work for you, and it'll save you an enormous amount of time in achieving your goals. And can I, can I just get on that for a second? Um, agreed. Okay, I like you, but I'm gonna disagree with you, but it doesn't mean anything with, like, with regards to our friendship relationship here. Um, <laughs> Should I run for cover? <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, um, if I could link this back with what Taylor had been saying with regards to you know, ostensibly implying that there's microcultures within arts units and things change between one school and another okay I, I mean I've seen this before in the research where where one wonderful model that's going to work at University A in the in the music department is not going to work in the in the art department at University A but may work at the music department at University Q and that's a really really wonderful thing now now I understand about about not wanting to reinvent the wheel but at the same time I um, I would I would warn that, that, that simply taking models left and right and thinking they're gonna work may not be the best idea. Um, this, this is where getting the faculty together and having an idea together of how you want to proceed is probably the best way to go. Obviously keeping an eye specifically on the outcomes that you want for your programs, the outcomes that you already have for your programs. I'm a big fan of, of never divorcing the outcome um, never divorcing the outcome of your entire unit from your, from your entrepreneurship program. They have to be linked, because if they're not linked, then they're disassociated. If they're disassociated, then, there's, then, then, then students aren't going to win. That defeats it. So I would just say be careful. And, and I would like to follow up on, on both of those things, because the um, and start with with the moral imperative and I think t to me having something that is a <coughs> life that is based on the great music education you have I think is our moral and ethical responsibility if we're going to sit there with prospective students coming in saying come to our university <coughs> and pay us tuition and be here for four years and this is something I had to think through when I bet went back for my doctorate I, so, well, do I want to teach? Can I recruit people to music <coughs> programs knowing how tough it is out there, knowing how tough it is in, in our city? And, and what I came to is that there are a lot of great things that people can do with a music education. And it's not so much, you know, and yes, we learn from the business schools, but we have a lot to teach the business schools. We do amazing things. We have diverse skills that are, are not just technique, but it's the musicality, the, un, the unknown, the, the things that are the intangibles. We learn how to learn that stuff systematically in our playing, and we learn how to present and connect to audiences. We just have to think about the value of the skills that we already have and make that systematic and know how to go out there and deliver it. And so if you think that way about using the great music education you're having to serve needs, to to really use your skills in a in a
basis right at the moment, then you can do anything with that degree rather, regardless of its, uh, if it's in music performance or education or going into something that's not in music. We have a great education program that where in failure, it's not failure if you go and do something else other than being in a music degree and you've learned how to learn and you've learned how to set goals and achieve and put singular skills into an organizational context. Those are amazing skills that people in other majors don't do like we do. We, and, and so we shouldn't take a back seat to the business school. We learn best practices from business schools and then we go back and we teach them something too. And it's, uh, so I, I would uh, say that we, we have, and, and with doing that, then we can ethically recruit and say, we will teach you to how to be an achiever in life through this program, through a music education. Okay, all right, this is getting exciting here. So um, any other questions from the audience? If not, they'll probably ask each other questions here. All right. Well, actually, I want to jump on something here. <laughs> All right. Now that you got me going here. So, this is like the seventh inning stretch. But, um, it's the seventh inning already. <laughs> maybe it's the ninth inning. Oh, at, at any rate, so one of the things that I pondered a, a, a few years ago was okay, if in good conscience we're graduating too many people, too many students with performance degrees and they can't get jobs in their chosen degree, maybe we ought to cut down on the number of graduates, right? That seems logical. You know, if we can't increase supply, increase demand, we should cut down on supply. Now, of course, that would be suicide uh, for any uh, dean of music or anybody who you know wants to work in that field, and it's not reasonable. And the reason why it's really not reasonable is because who are we to tell people not to pursue their dreams? If your dream is you want to be playing in a symphony orchestra or or a string quartet or something of that kind of ilk, or be in a ballet, or be an artist, or be a filmmaker, whatever it is in the arts, and feel passionate about that where you can't think of doing anything else, who are we to tell them not to do it? But what, we, what our moral imperative is, is to show them and give them the tools for them to do it in different ways where they will reach that kind of satisfaction in their life. Maybe it's not that they'll get a job playing in a full-time orchestra. Maybe what it is, like I see with a lot of my colleagues in the Austin area, maybe they base their income on teaching, either privately or maybe in a school or whatever, and then they play with various orchestras in the area. None of them are full-time, um, but they're professional jobs, and they get to play the repertoire that you, know, you studied. Or maybe it's, um, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's some other kind of combination. So what we need to teach them is that there are shades of gray in finding satisfaction in what we do as artists. And that's something that we've been really lacking in because it's always been, you know, either you're going to be a, a symphony orchestra player or you're going to be a concert soloist or maybe you'll get into a string quartet. And these are all ors as opposed to ands. Maybe you'll play in a string quartet that's really good and you'll have a university teaching job where your quartet is there and you go and do X number of concerts a year and you play the repertoire that just so moves you or maybe some other combination. So our job is to teach them all these shades that are available and make them understand that and that's, that has just not been happening. So that, that's really the area that we need to be looking at. Yeah, let me, let me just, just, just go on that. I, I totally agree with you, but at the same time, I but. think, but, <laughs> I want to go further, actually, in support of that and say that it's not just, just that moral responsibility. I, you know, speaking as myself and as a researcher and as a professor, um, I don't think we're teaching students to think, especially in the context of assessment culture. I don't know about you, but when I get students as freshmen, right, bubbles A through D are perfectly fine and that's how life works. You know, and the bubbles E through F cause the existential crisis. <laughs> you know? They may be able to add two and two, but to put two and two together is a different story. And it's not their fault. And I think that, you know, a little bit on the moral responsibility on our end as well, especially on the entrepreneurship side, is that we have to realize that in the classroom. And, not, and it's, not just, it's not just, you know, if you teach entrepreneurship, I think it's everybody. 
to help them think in different ways, especially in the context of this training, which the blinders are like this and they're 40 feet long. We all know this. It's just the way it is. And, and you know, if you're, if, if you're from assessment culture and then all of a sudden the blinders are on, you know, bubbles A through D, and then the blinders are on, and then they get out, and then it's like the big, the big fat hairy world. That's a moral responsibility that I think that, that all of us, um, regardless of discipline, really have to address in a very serious and meaningful way. And one of the reasons why I say that is because being, being like the luckiest man in the world getting to teach, I mean seriously, I mean, come on, that's the coolest thing ever, right? To actually see students or have students come up to you and say, look, I really don't want to test. But I don't want to test for a different reason. You know, when they say to you in your office, look, you know, everything's the same. You know, is this class going to be the same too? No. No, they want to be challenged. They really do because they don't like assessment culture either. And, 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 I, and I say that from the bottom of my heart because I have seen it time and again. And it never ceases, ceases to, to give me unbelievable hope that, that the generation of kids that we have now may, may indeed be you know, one of the first that can actually do it. These kids really are amazing, even though assessment culture has got them to the point of where they are, and music training will get them to another point. They want to break out of it. It's our responsibility to bloody empower them to do it, and that's where, and, and, and that's where, where I think entrepreneurship education conceived in, in a more progressive way, which in fact, I mean, the, the business school has been talking about that for almost 20 years now. That's the beauty of, of, of really investigating entrepreneurial theory in the context of designing these programs, because even though nobody agrees on what entrepreneurship is, and nobody does, you can pull out some of the most wonderful, rich literature from the business school and apply it to almost any microculture you're in. And then have that inform everything that you do and then have that empower students. And if you think teaching opportunities are wonderful, you know, I mean, you know, we've all, we've all, had, we've all had the teaching opportunity where all of a sudden the student, you know, understands the difference between like a piano forte and a piano, right? Yeah, there's a difference. I'm talking about something more, something, and I, and, and I swear to God, and I've got, a witness, I've got a witness in this room, this happened to me Monday. I, I was teaching my entrepreneurship class, and, and, and it's a pretty good class, you know, pretty good, but, I, but you know, we were trying to, to learn, learn how to innovate a little bit, and to actually watch a student realize that they were empowered to leverage their degree for money, and what they wanted to do, you should have seen the body language. It went from this to this with that weird smile on their face and the weird gleam in their eye. And it wasn't just, oh, the difference between a piano and a piano forte. It was, oh my God, I can actually do this. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And the light might not be at the end of the tunnel, it might be in two weeks. That's empowerment, and that's the beauty and the power of these entrepreneurship programs, which, and as I circle back to what Michael was saying. Which one? <laughs> I've been doing this all Michael time. the Large, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> which one? <laughs> the cool thing about entrepreneurship and getting these kids to think in a different way is that all of a sudden, you know, arts-related anything becomes a distinct, not only reality, but a distinct fulfillment. And that is a mind-blowing thing for these kids who are coming out of assessment culture. That's very good. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to jump in here. We're getting really close to, to time, and, and it's been a long day. I, uh, Maud had her hand up, but right. you wanna just ask them after Thanks. class? Or, <laughs> All right, after class, we will do, oh, it's, yeah, from the class, here we go. Um, from our, our seminar, we will go up to the bar, all of those who are interested, and we can continue this discussion. So I think we've had some really great sessions here, 
And I want to thank these three presenters for uh, enlightening us on the many aspects of entrepreneurial programs here and to get us all thinking and for what, what all you have done uh, before in thinking about careers in entrepreneurship. It's been a great um, pre-conference. And uh, anything else, Michael, that you need to say? Don't forget to fill out your evaluations because we really want to get your feedback. It's really vital to us. Where do they go after? Um, give them to me. Sure, give them to me. Okay. Or any of the people on the committee, for that matter. So I, I think, uh, Angela, any other uh, announcements? So I, I think it's to the bar. Which and one? upstairs, oh, the, the, the Pulse. The Pulse, it's a great looking bar. We haven't been there yet. <laughs> but um, so <laughs> you can join each other there and continue the questions. Thanks. Thank you again. And thank you, Michael, and your committee and everyone for setting this thank up. You. Terrific. Thank you.